Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining our monthly healthcare provider briefing webinar, where we share relevant public health updates regarding COVID-19. My name is Dr. Cindy Shen, and I'm a public health physician at York Region Public Health. I'll be presenting this webinar with my colleague, Dr. Mavish Nirani, who is also a public health physician here. As always, a very big thank you to our corporate communications partners and to our team who have put this together. So thanks to Anastasia, Deanna, Emily, Joe, Sumit, and Umar. Next slide, please. So a few housekeeping items to note before we start. Throughout the meeting, um, you will be able to ask questions or comment using the chat box. Questions will be sorted to avoid duplication, and we'll try to go through as many questions as we can during the Q&A session following the presentation. Your name would not appear on the screen to attendees, although the presenters and moderators would have this information. And this meeting will be recorded. So if you have any questions about the recording, please contact HEOC Liaison at the email address noted here. Next slide, please. To ask a question, you can click on the Q&A icon on the right side of the screen. You can then type your question in the compose box and select send. Questions will be screened by the moderator and posed to the presenters. As mentioned, we'll try to get through as many questions as possible during the webinar, and answers to any outstanding questions will be sent through the Public Health Matters uh, listserv at a later time. The slide deck for this presentation will also be shared following the webinar. Next slide. So we will be going over several topics today. Uh, we'll start with some local epidemiological data, including some information on variants. We'll then go through some provincial level updates, including the stay at home order, the latest self-isolation recommendations, and updated directive and guidance documents. Following that, we'll go through a number of topics related to vaccines, followed by additional resources, and finally, the Q&A session. Next slide, please. So we'll start with some epidemiological updates. Uh, looking at case counts over time in York Region, we have seen an increase in the number of daily cases since early March. However, the daily case count appears to have peaked on April 18th, which was 10 days after the stay-at-home order was enacted. And since then, it has steadily decreased. The day seven, uh, sorry, this, uh, the seven-day moving average also peaked back on, back on April 18th. The daily case numbers for variants of concern and mutations of interest have similarly decreased. However, the proportion of cases that are of variants of concern or mutation of interest has remained steady, ranging from 75% to 79%. Next slide, please. The number of outbreaks appears to have followed a similar trend. So looking at the specific settings, we have seen a decrease in the number of outbreaks in institutions, such as long-term care homes and retirement homes, likely as a result of the vaccine rollout. And when we see cases in long-term care homes and retirement homes, we're really seeing no or very few resident cases, which is quite reassuring. However, we're still seeing some cases in these settings, especially among unvaccinated staff. Since the province moved schools to virtual learning, the number of school outbreaks has significantly decreased as well. However, since early March, uh, there has been an increase in the number of outbreaks in childcare settings. So we're keeping a close eye on this and workers in these settings are eligible for the vaccine. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, there has been a decrease in the number of variants of concern and mutation of interest cases since early April. Uh, variants of concern labeled here are cases that had undergone genomic sequencing and were found to be a variant. More than 80% of the variants found through sequencing are of the B117 strain. The other two variants of concern were the P1 strain and the B1351 variant. Also to note, more recently, York Region received two cases of B1617, which is a variant of interest at this point, and both of these cases had known travel history. On the other hand, uh, the mutation of interest cases are those that were screened for two mutations. 
These are the N501Y mutation and the E484K mutation. These mutation screens help identify variant cases more quickly. Specifically, specimens that test positive for N501Y and negative for E484K reflect the B117 variant. And since the end of March, these were not sequenced subsequently. So among mutation interest cases, about 90% reflect the B117 type or the UK strain. Also to note, Public Health Ontario continues to sequence some of the specimens that screen negative for both mutations in order to monitor for other lineages of potential variants. Next slide, please. So we know about the three variants of concern in Ontario, which contain more than, uh, which contain one or more mutations for which there is either conclusive or strong evidence that it will have an impact on public health or clinical practice, including transmission, virulence, and vaccine efficacy. On the other hand, there are variants of interest, which are suspected to be more contagious than the wild type strain, or cause more severe disease, or escape vaccine protection. So these are variants with specific genetic markers that have been associated with changes to receptor binding, reduced antibody neutralization, Reduce treatment efficacy, potential diagnostic impact, or a predicted increase in transmissibility or disease severity. But they do not yet meet definition for a variant of concern based on the evidence available. B1617 is one of these variants of interest. So this variant was first uh, identified in India back in October. It has become the most uh, common variant in India and has spread to more than 20 countries. In Canada, B1617 lineage has been reported in Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, Quebec, and more recently in Manitoba. And this particular variant uh, has been called double mutant uh, because of two key spike uh, protein mutations. Though like with the other variants, there are actually a number of other mutations as well. The first key mutation is the E484Q mutation, which lies at the same location as the E484K mutation. And I have, uh, as I have mentioned, um, you know, E484K is present on the P1 and B1351 variants already. The second mutation is the L452R mutation. So with this particular variant, um, there is potential reduction in neutralization by some monoclonal antibody treatment and also slightly reduced neutralization by, by post-vaccination sera. So there's a potential concern regarding antibody, eva uh, antibody evasion and vaccine escape. This variant is still being studied and there's ongoing surveillance in Canada and internationally. Uh, in fact, just over the weekend, there was new information from the United Kingdom that suggests that the B16172 variant, which is one of the three closely related B1617 variants, may have increased transmissibility. So this situation would continue to be monitored closely. And in terms of preventive measures, uh, we know that Canada has stopped flights from India and in Pakistan back on. April 22nd to help reduce the spread of the variant. And of course, the same public health measures, such as physical distancing and masking, can help reduce the spread of this variant, just like for other strains. So continuing vigilance is crucial here. Next slide, please. And of course, close attention is also being paid to the variants of concern. Last month, Public Health Ontario published a new fact sheet which compared characteristics among the three variants of concern based on evidence up to the end of March. And the link to this document is provided here. So we know that all three variants of concern have increased transmissibility. And the B117 variant also appears to be linked to more severe disease. On the other hand, the B117 variant does not seem to have an impact on vaccine effectiveness, uh, which is good news, especially because most of the variants of concern that we have here is of this particular lineage. 
The P1 variant may have potential impact on vaccine effectiveness, while the B1351 variant may impact vaccine effectiveness. And you may find more information uh, about the types of studies um, in this particular fact sheet. And of course, the evidence around variants continue to evolve, so we continue to learn about these. And at the provincial level, Public Health Ontario continues to monitor the impact of vaccination and the emergence of variants, um, including specifically those with potential vaccine escape. And um, overall, it's so important to note that all vaccines are effective and reduce the risk of serious illness. And of course, adaptation of vaccines to these variants is also being looked into. The Public Health Ontario website also has a companion document for this fact sheet that can help with interpretation of this uh, comparison table, which you can also take a look at. Next slide, please. So now looking at provincial updates, um, we know that a stay at home order has been in effect in Ontario since uh, April 8th, and this is for a six week period. And this means that individuals are required to remain at home with exception only for essential purposes. There's no organized public events and social gathering permitted, except with members of the same household and people who live alone can gather with one other household. Individuals are required to work remotely with limited exceptions where on site work is necessary and all businesses and facilities have capacity limits to allow for physical distancing, while some businesses in particular may have additional capacity restrictions. There are also gathering limits for religious services, rites, or ceremonies, including weddings and funerals. So it's really important to convey to your patients that uh, they should continue following public health measures, uh, even if they're vaccinated. We know that it has been a while since the pandemic started, um, but we all really need to work together to help get the rates down. And the sooner we get this done, the sooner we may be able to resume some of these activities. Um, and for more information on enhanced public health and safety measures, um, you can refer your patients to the York Region Public Health Safety Measures page. Next slide, please. So a couple of new guidance documents were released by the province just last week that highlighted a few points related to self-isolation. One was version 12 of the management of case and contact document, and the other is a new interim guidance document for fully vaccinated individuals. So to summarize these recommendations here, essentially the following groups of people should self-isolate. Any confirmed or probable case, even if they're fully vaccinated. So for instance, if a close contact of a case becomes symptomatic, they should be considered a probable case and must self-isolate despite vaccination status. And of course, these cases would be followed by public health already. If someone is an asymptomatic close contact of a confirmed or probable case, they would need to self-isolate generally and it will be really important for the contact to follow the advice of the local public health unit. Public health would consider whether the individual was fully vaccinated 14 days prior, the specific individual circumstances, and any link to E484K mutation cases to make that determination about self-isolation in accordance with the latest guidance. And generally, anyone symptomatic should isolate and get tested even if they had mild symptoms or if they were fully vaccinated. If they test negative and they're not a close contact of case, they can stop self-isolating 24 hours after the symptoms have resolved. Also, generally speaking, household members of symptomatic individuals should self-isolate until the symptomatic individual receives a negative test or is provided an alternative diagnosis by a healthcare provider. And there are a number of resources listed here related to self-isolation that may be helpful. Public Health Ontario has a document on when to self-isolate for household members and a document on how to care for a child who needs to self-isolate. The other thing to note is that if self-isolation is not possible at home, the York Region Voluntary 
isolation center can be an option, and the link provided here would have information regarding eligibility. Next slide, please. So this slide includes several recently updated guidance documents and directives from the province. I had already mentioned the latest version of the management of case and contact document. There's also the interim guidance for fully vaccinated individuals to help support local public health work. And another th thing to note about the interim guidance on fully vaccinated individuals is that it really reiterated that even fully vaccinated people would need to continue following general public health guidance and infection prevention and control measures. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, it, dis it, it discussed the number of populations and considerations for decision making when it comes to self isolation. The latest version of Directive 3, which is issued to long term care homes, retirement homes, was also released just last week. And coupled with the latest guidance for long term care homes, it provided information on the IPAC measures required, including consideration for vaccination status and vaccine coverage in the facilities. And of, of course, Directive 2 was issued last month to regulated health professionals regarding cessation of non-urgent and elective surgeries. Next slide, please. So moving on to vaccine updates. We are in the middle of the phase two of the vaccination plan. The projected timeline of this was April to June. So in addition to the age-based rollout, uh, there is a focus on high-risk congregate settings, hotspot communities, individuals with health conditions and their essential caregivers, and those who cannot work from home. Next slide, please. So as of today, COVID-19 vaccine appointments in York Region are available to the groups listed here. Those aged 40 years of age and older who live in York Region, those aged 18 years of age and older who live or work in the 16 high priority communities, individuals who cannot work from home and listed in both Group 1 and Group 2 of the Provincial COVID-19 Vaccination Plan. In fact, Group 2 becomes eligible effective today. Also, individuals with highest, high, and starting today, at-risk high, uh, at-risk health conditions, and all healthcare workers, including those who work from home. So the plan moving forward is that during the week of May 17, those aged 30 years of uh, years and older who live in York Region would become eligible for the vaccine, and by the end of um, the, uh, sorry, and by the week of May 24th, the goal is really that those age 18 years and older who live in the region would become eligible for the vaccine. Also to note, uh, York Region announces new eligibility every Monday, depending on vaccine availability, and we're aligning with the provincial eligibility criteria. To receive updates on vaccine eligibility, you can tell your patients to visit york.ca slash COVID-19 vaccine regularly and to follow York Region social media channels. And your patient can select the group that they belong to and the website um, would also provide information on where they would be able to get the vaccine in terms of the specific locations available. Next slide, please. So here are um, the adverse conditions that are now newly eligible for the vaccine. So there are conditions such as uh, heart disease, supervascular disease, respiratory conditions, diabetes, liver disease, dementia, immune deficiencies and autoimmune disorders, all other cancers, along with other disabilities requiring direct support care in the community. And of course, those uh, with the highest risk conditions and high risk conditions are already eligible, including pregnant individuals. Next slide, please. So here's some information on high priority communities, commonly known as hotspots. These were identified by the province and had high historic and ongoing rates of COVID-19 transmission, hospitalization, and death. And the first three characteristics of the postal code is used to designate these geographical units 
which are also called forward sortation areas or FSAs. In New York region, the province has identified 13 high priority communities and York Region Public Health identified three additional high priority communities based on local and more recent epidemiological data. And this brings the total number of hotspot communities in York Region to 16. The postal codes for these communities are provided here and they are located in Vaughan, Markham, Richmond Hill, and there was one in East Gwillimbury. There appear to be several contributing factors for the higher COVID-19 case numbers in these locations, including more variant cases, which are more transmissible, higher population density, out and outbreaks occurring in settings such as manufacturing. So these communities have been prioritized when it comes to the vaccine rollout, including for essential uh, workplaces in these areas. And more recently, uh, York Region Public Health also expanded immunization to all individuals age 18 years and older who live or work uh, in these hotspot communities as presented in the previous slide. So as a healthcare provider, it is important to continue to promote and support vaccination, including those who live or work in these hotspots. Next slide, please. So this um, is a new EMR search that will help primary care providers to quickly identify patients in hotspot communities by postal code. And the search can be found and downloaded on the eHealth Center for Excellence community portal. And there are some support guides for the various EMRs, the links of which are provided on the slide. And again, you can also refer your patients to the COVID-19 vaccine website for vaccine eligibility and appointments. And your staff or yourself may also help support them in, in registering for these appointments. Next slide, please. There's also new information on eligibility for shortened uh, second dose appointments. So York Region Public Health and our partner-led clinics will now be providing uh, the following patients with their second dose within as close to a 21 to 28 day time frame as possible, specifically those who received solid organ transplant or a stem cell transplant, uh, individuals with cancer of the blood, bones, or lymph nodes who are undergoing active treatment, and people with malignant solid tumors undergoing active treatment. So to note, active treatment is defined as chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy, and it does not include radiation or hormonal therapy alone. And also to note, transplant patients and most cancer patients receiving active treatment should really consult with their specialist to determine the timing of the second dose based on their treatment and health condition. They're required to bring relevant documentation indicating eligibility in order to receive a shortened second dose appointment, and they should bring the letter to their first dose appointment. However, if they have already received their first dose and require their second dose in a shortened time frame, they should contact York Region Public Health. And it's important to note that the urban indigenous population and those who receive dialysis were recently announced as also being eligible to receive their second dose in this shortened time frame. Next slide, please. So in terms of how things are going with the vaccine rollout, as of May 7, over 492,000 York Region residents have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine which represents over half of the eligible adult population in our region. This is great news and we'll continue to work with others to put vaccines in arms. Looking at the breakdown by age group, about 90% of those aged 75 years and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And looking at the next two age groups among those 65 years to 74 years, more than 80%, have received the vaccine. And age groups between 50 and 65 years of age also had good vaccine coverage, ranging from 55% to more than 70%.
the younger age groups currently have lower vaccine coverage given the, the way the vaccines were rolled out, but this will continue to increase with expanded eligible um, uh, uh, vaccine eligibility. Next slide, please. So now I'll hand over to Dr. Mehrani to discuss a few other vaccine related updates. Thank you, Dr. Shen. So just as a reminder, you might have patients reach out to you to uh, discuss vaccine clinic appointments. Um, it's important that you emphasize that they confirm that they meet current eligibility that Dr. Shen just went through. Uh, at this time, appointments are, are booked for first dose, dose appointments only um, and vaccines are by appointment only, so uh, no walk-in appointments. Um, we encourage, um, we discourage that actually patients book appointments on multiple clinics. It uh, it prevents others from accessing um, a vaccine appointment. Um, a health card is not required to book through the York Region booking system, though it is required through the provincial booking system. Um, but you will need to show proof of age and residence um, when you go the day that you need to get your vaccine. Um, and if you have patients have any further questions on how to prepare, you can visit the link uh, below for further guidance. Next slide, please. So we want to take a moment to address uh, the concerns regarding thrombosis and blood clots post um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Many, many of you may have already seen this table, but we wanted to take a moment to, to highlight it during this presentation. Um, this diagram was put together by the Ontario Science Table um, as of May 2021 and addresses concerns related to vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia following the vaccine. Uh, so just um, if you look to the left of the, of the flow chart, symptoms of thrombosis or bleeding that uh, you may uh, want to look out for in your patients. So headaches, blurred vision, double vision, shortness of breath, um, chest or abdominal pain, um, multiple small bruises are just a few of the uh, symptoms that are posted there. If you do find uh, a patient of yours who's received the vaccine um, between 4 and 28 days um, and is presenting with these symptoms, um, do order a CBC to check platelet counts and then further investigations include ordering a D-dimer, blood film, or imaging based on your clinical suspicion. Um, and, and if in fact these results do come back positive, an urgent assessment by a hematologist may be required. Um, so just you know, something to keep with you as a tool in your clinical practice um, and something to keep in mind if you do encounter uh, such scenarios. Next slide, please. So we do also want to take a moment to address the actual risk associated uh, with the vaccine. So, um, you know, at this time, the benefits still outweigh the risks. Um, so if you if you look here um, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, the, the risk for um, the incidence of a, of a blood clot is one per 26,000 to one per 127,000 doses administered. So a Canadian estimate as of April 28th, 2021 is one per 100,000 doses. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has not yet been made available in Canada, but has been pre previously discussed in our, in our presentations. The risk again is one per 500,000 doses administered. Um, but if you want to put it into perspective for your patients, the risk of being an ICU among COVID-19 cases is one in 100 Canadians. And of course, that is an outcome that we want to absolutely avoid. Um, there have been over 1.1 million cases of COVID-19 in Canada so far, and COVID-19 has killed over 24,000 Canadians. So at this point, our messaging is still the same, that we encourage as many people to get vaccinated. Um, though we are aware that there is this risk, the risk is pretty low, um, and that we do have ways to monitor um, for, for uh, negative outcomes. Next slide, please. And as briefly mentioned on the previous slide, just an update on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, as a reminder, this is a single dose viral vector vaccine that has been authorized for use in Canada. 
Um, as of May 3rd, NASI has updated their guidance to recommend the use of this vaccine for individuals 30 years of, or of age or older without contraindications if the individual does not wish to wait for the mRNA vaccine and the benefits outweigh the risk for the individual. Um, we do understand that this um, guidance might be a little confusing. Again, um, you know, we just want to say at this point, the approach should be, you know, get, get vaccinated um, and not necessarily to hold off on waiting for, say, a particular vaccine just because um, the risk of COVID is so high. Um, of course, a single dose vaccine such as this one might be better suited for populations that are harder to schedule for a second dose. Um, for example, populations that are mobile or certain hard to reach populations. At this point, Canada has received 300 doses of the one dose vaccine um, currently being held by Health Canada while they investigate potential quality control issues. So just keep an eye out. You'll probably be receiving more information about this vaccine in the coming days. Next slide, please. And an update regarding Pfizer for adolescents. So on May 5th, Health Canada did authorize the use of the Pfizer vaccine in children um, between the ages of 12 to 15 years. The study included uh, over 2,000 adolescents in this age bracket who were randomized equally to receive two doses uh, compared to a placebo 21 days apart. Um, and based on the cases, efficacy was uh, quite high of 100%. Uh, no severe COVID-19 cases were reported in the study. In terms of adverse reactions reported within seven days of any dose included fatigue, headache, fever, muscle pain, swelling, and irritation at the injection sites. At this point, we, we don't have any information of when Health Canada um, or, or the provincial or the province will approve the use of Pfizer for adolescents. So again, something to keep your um to be waiting for for more information. Um, but something that we'll probably getting uh, more advice regarding in the coming coming weeks. Next slide, please. And another very hot topic has been vaccines and pregnancy. Uh, as many of you are probably aware now. The government has amended um, and made pregnancy risk level to the highest risk. Um, so at this point, you may have had many pregnant individuals reach out to you regarding should or should they not get the vaccine. Um, and I'm sure you've had this discussion about potential risks and benefits. Um, we want to just take a moment to point out the SOGC consensus statement that was reaffirmed as of May 4th. So this is the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. At this point, pregnant individuals should be offered vaccination at any time during pregnancy or while breastfeeding, as long as there's no contra contraindications. Um, given that pregnant people are at increased risk of morbidity from COVID-19 infection, all pregnant women um, should be eligible to receive the vaccine. And the SOGC supports the use of all available COVID-19 vaccines in Canada at any trimester pregnancy and during breastfeeding. So again, a just very um, important piece to highlight when speaking to your patients um, that at this point, really the, the benefits outweigh the risks unless there's some uh, contraindication that you're aware of. Um, and then certainly you can share the consensus statement with your patients. So um, when they're making the decision, um, they have this information with them. Next slide, please. Um, antibody testing and COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, a lot of labs in Ontario are offering antibody testing to patients. They're not uh, OHIP covered, so often patients are paying for this out of pocket. Um, at this time, antibody testing is not currently recommended uh, to assess for immunity to COVID-19. It doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not an appropriate way to diagnose COVID-19. It doesn't tell you if you're infectious or not. Um, you're still at risk for COVID, even if you have a positive test. Um, and just as mentioned on the slide, um, you cannot use it to assess um, the need for vaccination in an unvaccinated person. So uh, since vaccines induce antibodies to specific viral protein targets, uh, post-vaccination serologic test results will be negative in persons without a history of a previous natural infection 
if the test you use does not detect those antibodies induced by the vaccine. So again, the utility of this test at this point um, is very low. We don't encourage patients to, to be getting tested. Um, and of course, there is this fee as, uh, attached to it. So um, there shouldn't be, um, again, if you have any um, concerns, feel free to ask us um, questions. But at this point, it's not currently recommended um, uh, as per guidance. Next slide, please. Um, and at this point, we just want to remind all our primary care providers that there are currently um, primary care offices, about 40, administrating the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, for those um, clinics that are already offering the vaccine, there is a primary care vaccination community of practice that you can join. The link will may be made available um, once you have access to the slides, and it's just a good way to learn and support um, colleagues. If you did not receive this survey or would like to administer AstraZeneca vaccine in your clinics, please um, email the email listed in the slide, um, as well as if you'd like to immunize at a mass immunization clinic, uh, please uh, email at the following email address. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Shen. Thank you, Dr. Mirani. So I'll quickly touch on a few additional resources that may be of interest. Um, there are a number of vaccine related resources uh, listed here that were recently published. Uh, Public Health Ontario has a number of documents on mRNA vaccine, viral vector vaccine, uh, vaccine competence and vaccine effectiveness. They also review adverse events following immunization regularly and the latest report is linked here. Uh, the Ministry of Health also has updated guidance regarding Pfizer and Moderna as well. Next slide, please. So another helpful resource may be the Ontario eConsult service, which is a web-based tool that allows physicians and nurse practitioners timely access to specialist advice. It has a group that can answer questions related to COVID-19, such as those related to allergy and pregnancy. And some information is provided here regarding access. Next slide, please. There are also a number of additional links that you may want to bookmark. So the Center for Effective Practice has a COVID-19 resource center that provides practical evidence for primary care. You can also find up-to-date information on our York Region Healthcare Providers page and the general COVID-19 page. Also to report an adverse event following immunization, you can access the AC form provided here. And lastly, the Ministry of Health has a web page that contains up-to-date guidance documents for the healthcare sector and a separate web page on vaccine related documents. Next slide, please. So that concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. Um, so now we'll take a look at the questions that you have sent. Um, so the first question is about um, public health tracing all of the contacts for positive patients and whether that's happening. Um, and so, yeah, for, for sure, contact tracing is a very important pillar when it comes to COVID-19 prevention and control. So for sure that is um, occurring, um, you know, depending on how things are, sometimes operationally there may be minor changes, but we are following the provincial guidance regarding uh, contact and case management. There was a question about uh, when can 12 to 15 year olds starting to receive vaccines? Um, and so as Dr. Mehrani mentioned um, in her presentation, uh, we are awaiting information from the federal government, specifically NACI, but also the province regarding uh, these aspects. So please stay tuned. And again, COVID-19 vaccine page um, for New York region is a really good place to look up the most up-to-date information related to vaccine eligibility and vaccine clinic location. There are a couple of questions related to that. There's an, another question about um, do the um, does the whole household need to isolate if one of their members is told to isolate because of having close contact with a COVID positive patient? Note that the member who has close contact is asymptomatic. So that's a really good question. And I think I saw another very similar question in the chat box as well. So if the person in the household is a close contact, uh, it's important to ask if they're symptomatic. So if they're symptomatic, they're a probable case. 
So in that case, any contact or any close contact of this probable case would definitely need to isolate. On the other hand, if the um, close contact of a known case is asymptomatic, then you know they're not a probable case. And what we're saying to the uh, household members of this particular individual is that they should stay home except for essential reasons. And really with the stay at home order happening, it's pretty much everybody should be doing that. Um, and uh, on the other, yeah, you know, and, and to go with, along with that, when it comes to testing, if the household member um, is asymptomatic, um, the person who is being monitored or who is isolating as a close contact is also asymptomatic, um, then they don't really, and, and the, you know, they didn't test positive, then they don't really need to get tested. I know there was another question regarding that, but you can find more information um, in the latest case on contact management document that we have linked in a previous slide, um, you know, which will provide information uh, regarding isolation. Okay, and there's another question about uh, studies that have studied the incidence of thrombo, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia and other with other adenovirus vector vaccine. So I think, you know, a lot of studies are being generated or that are exploring these different topics and Public Health Ontario, um, you know, as the provincial agency and scientific advisor, I'm sure is also closely monitoring the situation along with the Ontario Science Table. Um, there's a question about current evidence for prevention of asymptomatic infection. I wonder if that has to do with vaccines in particular and the latest information from Public Health Ontario does say that evidence suggests that vaccines may reduce COVID-19 transmission, either by preventing infection or by reducing the incidence of symptomatic diseases. So hopefully that's helpful. There was a question about clearance of patients um, who still test positive after two weeks isolation. Um, so you know, we're following the quick reference guidance on testing and clearance uh, from the Ministry of Health, and that really contains information on time-based clearance criteria. In general, we're no longer following or requiring a test-based clearance. Um, and what that means is that depending on the severity of illness, depending on some, if someone was immunocompromised, um, then they would be able to be cleared after two weeks, or actually right now it's after 10 days um, if they actually fulfill the symptom resolution criteria as well. So there are a number of factors that go into that determination of whether somebody can come out of self-isolation and the quick reference guidance is a good resource to look at if there is interest. Although our public health unit here would be, you know, making those determinations. So hopefully that's helpful. And I recognize that we're at 1258. Uh, uh, I see that there are still some questions and some, in particular, some vaccine related questions. So what we can do is again, we will compile all of the questions that were not answered and we can uh, send out the Q&A document through Public Health Matters afterwards. So maybe we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you. So this is just a reminder that you can subscribe to Public Health Matters by going to our health professionals webpage and clicking on e-newsletter for healthcare professionals. And also please uh, spread the word and encourage your colleagues to sign up as well. And also, as mentioned, we'll be sending out these slides after the webinar as well. Next slide. So that concludes the webinar. Uh, thank you so much for your participation today and hope you have a good day.